I'm Jamie Sorensen. I went to San Diego State Nursing School here. I graduated back in 2004, so I'm an alum. And at the end of the class, I will answer some questions that you guys have about nursing school or the boards or being a nurse. I just retired from the military after almost 25 years in the military. The last uh, almost 10 of those, I was a nurse practitioner and I was a nurse from 2000 four after graduating from here and I was enlisted prior to that and I'm currently starting my own private practice. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, clinical nurse specialist, bachelor's in psychology, bachelor's in nursing, and uh, a lot of it from San Diego State. All right, now I'm going to get started. We'll start off with the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. So the people who answer the phone are actually um, professionals. You have to be at least master's prepared, you know, so like a master's social worker, PhD, MD, PsyD, something like that. But because I give this lecture, I always want to make sure that I really know what I'm talking about. And so I called there and I said, you know, I'm getting ready to go do a lecture at a university and I was, you know, trying to get information about who answers the phone and what do you offer them. And she said, you know, they ask people a lot. They find people while they're on the phone, if they're willing to accept job placement, home placement, get them in for a psychiatric appointment, and of course, emergency care when they're calling as well. So I was pretty impressed with that. How many of you guys have heard of the Trevor Project? Anyone heard of the Trevor Project at all? How many people in here are 25 and under? Right, most of you guys? All right, so the Trevor Project, it was this short video. It was a fictional video. And the kid is kind of suicidal. He's gay and he's doing a bit of immersion therapy to try to make himself straight. And as a result of that, there was funding and an awareness, you know, about suicide rates. So the Trevor Lifeline came about, and that's for people who are 25 and under, or 24 and under, and they can call, text, you know, or chat in different ways and, you know, get help for suicide prevention. I'm gonna go over it in a few minutes, but, you know, suicide rates um, is the second leading cause for death for people 10 to 34 years old. So, and it keeps going up. So the Trevor Lifeline is a great advocate. In the LGBTQIA community, suicide rates are two to eight times greater than the heterosexual community. So it's very needed. And I called them my, too, and I'm like, um, I'm not under 25, and <laughs> very, very kind man who answered the phone. All right, Dr. Kim told me that some of you guys did the out of the darkness walk. I always talk about that. Who all did that in here? Awesome. Okay, why did you guys do it? What, what was the reason for it? Huh? Training? Credit. Credit. Oh, credit. Okay. All right. I've been talking about the out of the dark, darkness walk here for a long time. So I talked to a lady. Um, she contacted me through social media, and I'd never met her, but she, you know, she has this beautiful family, all these family photos, and she says, you know, my teenage daughter, young teen, has tried to kill herself a couple times, and she's like, I don't know what else to do. And I'm like, well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not your provider, you know, you know, I have to be very clear about that. But I said, have you considered going to an out of the darkness walk, or whatever suicide prevention walk, you know, that's for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And when you go to those things, so yes, you raise awareness, but there are people who the parents of someone who committed suicide there as well, you know? And then there's other kids who are suicidal. Somebody might be that selfish kid who's just kind of thinking about their own pain. And when they go there, they're like, wow, this is what I could do to my family, or there is hope, or I'm not alone in this. So it's multiple reasons. It's very multifactorial why I would do that. Does that make sense? And it's almost like a discouragement, you know, for people for out of the darkness. All right, suicide leading causes of death. I updated all the slides last night. So as you guys can see, 10 through 34, uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death. Uh, then it goes down to like the fourth leading cause of death. Of course, as we get eight older, our health declines. We don't take care of our health as much. You know, it would make sense that other illnesses would be more of the reasons that individuals die. Uh, I don't really believe this for 65 and plus. I think the suicide rates are much, much higher than what is documented on here. All right, so means of death, right? Who's more likely to commit suicide with a firearm, male or female? With a gun, male, okay. And then suffocation, what does that normally mean? Hanging yourself, yep. And like, what would be an example of other injury? Suicide by cop. Suicide by cop, yep, absolutely. All right, what are other ways? would be other. It's interesting because this says fall. I think the Coronado Bay Bridge would be an example of other more so than fall. It's a bit different. And I actually, I live in Coronado 
and uh, they do a lot of suicide prevention work. There's a lot of people there to really um, get barriers put around the Coronado Bay Bridge so people do not jump. Would having barriers on the Coronado Bay Bridge be a deterrent from committing suicide? If that was like their really ideal way to go, it might be a deterrent. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so access to means is huge, right? Um, I'm gonna show a couple more slides in a few minutes. So there's people who have a death wish, like no matter what, I am going to kill myself. Whatever means possible, and if this doesn't work, I'm gonna do something else. But there's also a lot of impulsive suicides. You know, it's like that divorce paper in the moment, you know, you don't have a diagnosed mental illness, you've never been treated, everything's going good. You get the divorce papers, there's a bridge. Does that make sense? Or a kid leaves for college. So it's access. And then when you are taking care of people, post-suicide attempt, maybe even people who put a gun in their mouth and shot themselves in the head but didn't die, you ask them, you know, you're getting out of the hospital, you know, you're a woman, would you ever disfigure your face by shooting yourself in the head? Like, oh no, I would never do that. Like, you know, then you talk to men, like, would you take poison to try to kill yourself? And they're like, uh, no, I don't want to be a vegetable. It's just typical answers. If you look at that, poisoning and firearms are about equal when it comes to committing suicide, right? and then followed by suffocation, which um, is typically hanging. Like if the other numbers are going down from slide to slide, why do you think hanging kind of goes up percentage-wise? Why do you think that is over like firearms and poisoning? What are some of your thoughts on that? Yes, please. Easy access to a rope. Easy access to a rope or a bed sheet or whatever. Yep, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things, you know, your clothes, pants, anything. You know, and that's, you know, when I worked in the prisons, they literally gave people what was called a turtle suit. And it was a green, like round piece of material. And it had Velcro straps on the side and then green Velcro strap on the back. And that was it. And they were on suicide watch. I mean, they had nothing else, you know, to, to have access. It made it very difficult. Women more likely to kill themselves by poisoning than men. But suicide through firearms with women is almost equally as lethal and then men more likely to do it through firearms. Make sense, right? That's not a surprise to anyone. Why would it cost, back in 2013, and I keep looking this up through the CDC, why would it cost $50.8 billion in work and employment-related expenses for suicide, medical expenses? What, where does that, all that money come from that costs the economy that much money? Any ideas? Maybe people are sad and grieving, yep. And then, you know, the medical expenses to take care of the family afterwards. You know, if a CEO kills himself, what's gonna happen to all the employees in the company? So there are plenty of people who have a very callous, hard attitude towards suicide until it affects them. And I've seen that happen a lot. You know, people will be very dismissive and, oh, you know, you just do like the little hand-holding work. And then sure enough, like they contact me, like once a family member or someone they know commits suicide. But for people like that, you know, I've, I really approach them from a business standpoint. It's like, okay, well think about the business cost. Think about the financial implications that suicide has on our economy. You know, this is why it matters as well. So suicide rates, I don't think it's a secret that the rates are going up, right? Um, especially in the younger children. And this is kind of, you know, when I said earlier, so I didn't really believe that um, statistic about, you know, people 65 and older, how it's just dropping off. I think there's a lot more suicides that people rule as a accidental death or, you know, from a disease process. But I think probably people aid in their own death after that age, you know, due to multiple factors, chronic pain, what are there some, some of the factors that people who are older might want to kill themselves? Poverty. Poverty, okay, yeah, yep. Loss of a loved one. <laughs> loss of a loved one, grief, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They don't want to be a burden on their family and you know, they don't want to leave people in financial debt, yeah. Loss of independence. Loss of independence, right? Feel like they're dependent, feel like they're a burden. Loss of their own autonomy, you know, it's like I can't even go to the bathroom by myself. I hate living this way, especially if you've been pretty independent. So that's just something to think about, you know, and it's like, especially, you know, when you are a nursing student, it's kind of uncomfortable to walk into a patient's room and being like, wow, this person's old enough to be my grandparent. Like, are you thinking about suicide? You know, and I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna give a lot of more specific examples, but you have to have those chats. So I think you guys know probably from the suicide prevention out of the darkness walk, 
how frequent, you know, there's death by suicide every 12 minutes in the US, right? So if you look at suicide percents by state, it's really going up in the dark blue states and it's going down in the white states, which is only one state that's decreasing, which is Nevada. Why would the suicide rates be decreasing in Nevada? The economy's doing really well. There. Really well, really well, yep. The housing market's doing well, you know, a lot of programs. Why would it be going, increasing so much in like Idaho and Wyoming, the Dakotas, Montana? Why would the suicide rates possibly be going up so much there? I'm guessing it's the opposite, the economy's not doing well there. Perhaps the economy, I think the economy is fairly strong, but yeah, that's a big reason, but also like the meth, the crystal meth epidemic, that's a big reason. What are some of the other reasons that you guys can think of off the top of your head? Go ahead. Does the um, <clears throat> severity of like the weather there. Seasonal affective depression disorder. Yeah, that can always play a role in it. Yep. Cuts in programs. So this is a really interesting slide right here. So it shows somebody who has no mental health condition versus a known mental health condition, how they're going to kill themselves. So a male who has no known mental health conditions, he, and they go back and they do a psychological profile on him. What's a psychological profile on someone? Go through their medical records, look at their lives, what are some of the reasons going on with them psychologically that they would commit suicide. So they go back and it's like, did this person have a history of mental illness? Was there anything in their medical record? And that's no mental illness, 84% chance for the male. 84% down to 69%. For firearms, it goes from 55% down to 41%. Why does it have a 14% drop? What are some of the reasons that you would think versus someone has a known mental illness versus non-mental illness? Why are some of the reasons that they're not like as likely to kill themselves after they've gotten treatment via firearm? Go ahead. People who are mentally ill probably don't have the same access to firearms. Yep, they went in, they've removed them, they've talked to them about it. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a really great answer. So why does the suicide rates for men who are no history of mental illness versus men who have a history of mental illness, why does it decline from 84 down to 69%? Why would that happen? Yeah? Um, because maybe since the mental illness or that condition isn't known, there's treatment for it. Yeah, okay. And so it goes up in women, down in men. All right, yeah. Why are men with uh, no known mental illness why is the percentage uh, that they commit suicide so much higher than females, but if they have a known mental illness, it goes down significantly? What, what are some of your thoughts on that? Men have less, they're better at hiding a mental illness because they're less likely to ask for help. Uh -huh. So then you wouldn't know that they have a mental illness and they wouldn't be getting help? Absolutely, absolutely. And just so you guys know, when you give me answers, they're almost always right. But who's more likely to talk? Who are the biggest chatters, women or men? Women, right? So what happens? And you know, it's like, uh, you know, I had a 25 year military career. Most of my patients have been men, a huge percentage, right? And so it's like them coming into my office, like this is the first time I've ever, ever talked about this. You know, they hold things in and compartmentalize. So the importance of just talking and getting things out through, you know, getting help is huge. Reasons why people commit suicide. I don't think this is a surprise to any of you guys. Relationship problems, crises in the past, health problems, right? legal problems, financial, substance abuse, right? Why is it a public health problem? You know, billions lost every year for the people who are just business. 25 suicide attempts for every suicide actually that people die by fatality. So for every suicide, somebody has tried to commit suicide 25 times. All right, risk factors for suicide. Does somebody want to read these for me? Uh, Okay, great, thank you. So family history of suicide, why does that matter? Why, why would that play a role? It could possibly imply the severity of the mental illness. That yep, genetics, absolutely, genetics, depression, the mental illness that goes along with the person who commits suicide. All right, what are some other factors? They might see that as an example of like how their life is supposed to, like how it's gonna end. 
normalizing, normalizing a suicide. Yep, it's happened in my family. I know how. This is the path moving forward. Just like when a celebrity commits suicide, you know, their suicide rates really go up. And then, so have you guys ever heard of like fighting with the Hatfields and McCoys, right? Um, so the West Virginia, um, Kentucky border, there was like these family feud that went on for years. And uh, one of the guys comes home after fighting, he'd gotten shot and he's, you know, wailing in pain. And his mom's like, why don't you just be a man and kill yourself like your brother, right? So there's also one of Malcolm Gladwell's books where he talks about there's this island where the suicide rates are huge. It's just a normalized thing. It just happens and just people just kind of accept it, you know? Or sometimes after a suicide too, people just completely shut down and they don't talk. And then sometimes they talk a lot more, it can really happen. History of child maltreatment, what is that? You know, so that's childhood abuse, okay. Why would somebody who has a lot of childhood abuse, why would they be more likely to commit suicide? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And then, okay, give me a couple other thoughts. Um, you could have ineffective coping skills, and they don't, they didn't have like someone to go to when they were younger instead of like they're talking when they're older. They didn't like deal with it properly. Absolutely, absolutely. And they grew up thinking I'm nothing, right? Maybe like the people who are supposed to love me, the people who are supposed to value me beat me and treat me horribly. So, you know, why would anyone ever love me? Why would I ever be valuable? You know, I spend a lot of time arguing with my patients about the fact that just because the people whose job it was to love you and take care of you and protect you failed miserably and did a horrible, horrible job, that doesn't mean that you're not lovable. And I spend a lot, a lot of time telling people that. Does that make sense? Like, so, you know, letting people know you're lovable regardless. They're like, if, if your parents didn't love you and didn't value you, they failed miserably. That was their job. That has nothing to do with you. So the concept that I could be loved, I could matter, it just doesn't exist. And they don't have the psychological reserve of self-esteem. You know, then some people, you know, obviously go to the extremes. History of previous suicide attempts, you know, it's kind of like the, the, the serious death wish. All right, why, why is that? Why does that play a role in suicide? The chances that someone's going to commit suicide again? Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, I've been in such a dark place. I've been there before. I have, you know, just wanted the pain to end. And I'm here again. I just want the pain to end. It's like it's never going away, the feeling of hopelessness. Why about, um, what is substance abuse? Why does that play a role in suicide? Maybe with like alcohol and substance abuse, it alters like your way of thinking. So if you're having a dark moment, it's like you're also like abusing the substance, you just impulsively do something. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe not even impulsive, maybe planned, but maybe both ways. Absolutely, great answer. Okay, yes? So it gets you away from like being in a sober state, so you're more in a pleasurable state. So now you can have like, you can think about more things and like have like pleasurable thoughts rather than uh, depressive symptoms. Right, so people, a lot of times people who use substances, they're pain to begin with, and so they go to the substance to get away from the pain, you know? So it's like a lot of times really getting down to the heart of the pain. Yes, go ahead. Also, like a long history of substance abuse, especially with drugs or opioids, um, can also lead to a lot of accidental overdoses. Like some people might already just want to use drugs to numb the pain, but then they don't realize how much they're using anyway. And then a lot of like, there's a lot of opioid over overdoses and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And just the feelings of hopelessness. I'll never get sober. I can never function. I can't get a job. Yeah, go ahead. Right, and a lot of times they burn the bridges. Like, you're high again. You stole from me to get drugs. I don't ever want to see you again. Exactly. Very good answers. Thank you all. Local epidemics of suicide. Why is that? So a celebrity commits suicide, and then there's a bunch of other people who commit suicide. It goes up. Why would a local epidemic of suicide increase the suicide rates? Normalizes it. This is my hero. This is the person I looked up to and I admired. And my fantasy was to have a life like theirs. And, you know, part of like dealing with the pain of life was like fantasizing. What if I have their life and now they killed themselves? Like, what do I have to look for now? So other risk factors. Isolated. I put hashtag loneliness. How many of you guys have heard that loneliness kills now more than smoking? And I'm very, very anti-smoking. But how many of you guys have heard that? 
Yeah, and what have you guys heard? Like, you know, it's like 40%, they said, increases like loneliness, you know, you, you know your chances of dying. And, and why is that? Go ahead. It's like mainly because if you're like, if you have chronic loneliness, like then you're more exposed to like having like you're more stressed, you're more like, it's just related to like your physical health too. Absolutely, There's, talking is so important, right? And like we are designed to connect. Have you guys done the Terry, study the Terry Cloth Monkeys yet in the psychology classes? where they um, took the monkeys, right, and they did the experiment on them, and they put a terry cloth around one of the metal monkeys, and then just another metal monkey, and they put milk with the metal monkey, so the baby had the opportunity of either having the comfort from the terry cloth or the, the milk, and they a lot of times preferred, you know, they just hung on to that cloth. We're designed to connect. We're designed to be in each other's lives. We're designed, you know, to be social beings. But yeah, it's so important. Like you're having a bad day and you validate like, hmm, no, I remember you had better days. I remember you have this going on. You have all of these strengths. You have all of these abilities, the encouragement, the support, right? And sometimes you got to really look at who you're surrounded by because those people can actually make you more lonely, right? Sometimes it's like good to weed out the toxic individuals in your life so you have room for people who enrich your life and don't make you feel lonely. Or just really kind of have a boundary um, with the people who you know, contribute to loneliness. I already talked about, you know, physical illness. And so when you guys are doing clinicals and whatnot, you go to work, think about people who have been sick for a long time. They get really tired of suffering, you know, and have those conversations. All right, protective factors. So right now, there's a lot of research on the risk, right? But not so much research on the protective factors. You know, these are things that are definitely equally as important, uh, something to think about. So clinical care, right, support, Feeling connected, which is the exact opposite of lonely. Culture and religious beliefs that discourage suicide. Um, you know, I've had some people in my office, you know, it's like, oh, do I admit them or do I not admit them? You know, and I'm kind of on the fence and it's like, you know, because when you admit someone to a mental health hospital, there are sometimes consequences on their lives, like certain jobs, you know, they have to go back and do a clearance that can be used, you know, I've seen it used against people in adoption cases, divorce, custody, surrogacy. Those are all some of the reasons, you know, that's like, oh, you have this history of being mentally unstable. You can't do this. So it's like, you know, you have to have kind of a high threshold about who you admit and not admit. You can't just flippantly do it. So I'll ask them like, well, are you going to kill them yourselves? So, you know, very bluntly like that. And they're like, no. And like, I'm like, okay, why? And they're like, well, because I'm Catholic and I'll go to hell. And it's like, okay, you know, like that makes me feel better, you know, that your religion is really discouraging you from committing suicide, but it does play a big role. Is what I did and how I do this um, suicide prevention talk a little bit differently is I have these 30 sayings. So September is suicide prevention month, right? September 10th is suicide awareness day. And so what I did was I come up with a word for each day and why it matters. So someone can have a physical illness and never commit suicide. Someone can have a traumatic brain injury, never commit suicide. Someone could, you know, have everything, you know, as far as money, friends, everything, and still commit suicide. So once you've worked in mental health for a long time, uh, especially on inpatient, you've taken care of thousands of people who try to kill themselves. And so one of the things I'll sit there and talk to them, and there's, when you go into nursing, it's so important that you work the night shift, you know, because in the middle of the night, that's where you have the best conversations, and that's where you learn the most from your patients. But I'll say, well, what was missing? Like, why did you commit suicide? So these were like based on the conversations that I t had with the patients, you know? And I'll tell you, you, you know, sometimes you have to be very creative whenever you're trying to really help someone so they don't commit suicide. But what was missing? So listening. Do we live in a culture that listens a lot? No, no. So the other day I was at a, a with a group of people and one of the, the people in the group has a family member that's terminally ill. And somebody else said, uh, how's your um, father doing? And, you know, she started crying, and she's like, he, you know, well, his cancer is. And it's like, oh, I know another guy who has cancer. And she's crying. And I just got so mad. I said, let her speak. You know, like, it's not about you. Like, I know your ADHD is kicking in, but it's not about you. Let her talk. She needs to share her pain. It's very painful. Like, just asking her the question brings her tears. It's not all about you. Like, shut your mouth and listen. You know, that's what you have to do. And just really listen to people, you know. More so than anything is how you influence people is by listening to them. I never talk about politics at all. And it's funny because my closest friends don't even know my political beliefs. I will listen to both sides. And, you know, then I'll hear the conversation, well, I think this, I think this, and then towards the end of the conversation, like, well, we think, we think, we think. And just by listening to them, they feel that I validated them, right? So listening. 
All right, time, giving people your time. What does it mean when you give people your time? Just being present with them, even if it's just like sitting there quiet with them. Okay, but what's the message it gives people when you give them your time? Or what is, what's the message it gives people when you don't give them your time? Well, when you do give them your time, it shows you care. It shows you care, absolutely, absolutely. For you young single people in here, you know, if someone can't make time for you, they probably don't value you. You know, if you're not precious enough to be part of their time, move on to the person who will give you the time that you want, right? So time, time lets you know you matter to me, you're important to me, you know? And that's one thing now, you know, in private practice, I have to sit there and tell the patients in the beginning, okay, you know, this is how long we have. I wanna spend this portion of this time listening to you. I wanna spend this portion of the time you know, asking you questions so I make sure I heard you and I understand everything, then this percentage of time wrapping everything up and making sure I get your labs and your meds ordered. But I want to make sure that I start off by giving you my time and my focus because I want you to feel important and just listen, give them that time. Okay? Presence. She already said that. So I, um, I was in Denver and I was flying back to San Diego and the next day I had to fly out to Maine, right? And I had six hours between flights to go home, take care of my dogs, get some sleep. So I land in San Diego and you know, you turn your cell phone on and it's like ping, 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 all the messages. And this lady, um, very wealthy lady in my neighborhood had messaged me over and over, how are you doing, what are you up to? She doesn't hardly ever message me. It was really kind of concerning to me and I was so tired and I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta fly out of here in six hours, but I know something's up. Like every message was very positive, but I was like trusting my judgment. And so I said, hey, do you want me to come over and play cards with you? You know, I'm so tired. So I went over there and get like two hours. And I said, you know, at the end, you know, I, I was walking a dog with her and I said, were you thinking about killing yourself? And she's like, yeah, I was, but I'm not now. You know, as so I went there and I showed, I was present. I gave her time. I listened to her. I never asked her at all. I knew she needed something based on the volume of texts that I received from her. I mean, this lady texts me like once a month and all of a sudden I'm getting like five text messages from her. So giving them that and then compassion, right? So that example that I gave where, you know, there was a group of people and that person sitting there, you know, crying because their father's dying of a terminal illness and somebody else just writes away and says, yeah, well, my friend's friend has that same type of cancer, like cuts them off the symptoms. That's so uncompassionate. That does not show that you care, right? So compassion, just literally showing people, I, I care, you matter, you're important, right? Just give them that to them. And then empathy, right? What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? All right, so how many of you guys have ever had food poisoning in here? Right, pretty miserable, right? I had really bad food poisoning last night, so I came here like sick as a dog this morning. So I'm up here lecturing, but I'm not on my A game. But if you've had food poisoning, do you kind of understand, right? What it's like, yeah, that's empathy. You know, understanding like, wow, that's what it's like. And then what's a good way to show that you understand someone, that you can relate to them? Maybe provide some like mirroring and what they're saying to you, like, so what you're saying is, yeah, be careful, don't do that like too much though, because like, like when my friends pull that crap on me, I'm like, uh, do not even try to analyze me. You know, you gotta, you gotta say it, but that is a good way. Let me repeat it back. That's exactly the right answer, perfect answer. Just don't do it to mental health professionals. Um, but yeah, exactly, like, okay, so did I hear you right? So listening, listening shows that I understand. Or sometimes like, okay, I've been there too, after they've had a chance to talk. Like, wow, that must be really rough. And sometimes acknowledging, like, you know, I've never been in that experience before but it sounds painful and I've been in something, you know, kind of similar. So maybe I do understand a little bit from a different perspective, you know, being a woman who took care of men, you know, exclusively for the past three years in my job, you know, they had to know that I understood their, what they were going through. Right. And I'm not at all a man. I, do, I like being feminine, but you know, finding things to connect with them on. Right. So regardless of who you are, or what your background is, you can pretty much always connect with somebody on something. You know, great thing to connect with people on. Like, I understand you, I, you know. Boundaries. So boundaries are hugely important. Why is it so important to set boundaries in your life? What happens if you're, you become um, friends with somebody and they call you 15, 20 times a day? How would you feel about that? Someone, you, come, you become friends with somebody, they're a new friend, they're calling you 15, 20 times a day. After a while, what's it gonna do to you? Yeah, it can exhaust you, but I'm thinking more in terms of like being a yes man and then just keep saying yes everything and then you're just kind of exhausting you're, you're making yourself tired yep and, and you're growing to resent that person uh-huh absolutely what else they're going to take advantage of you and you're just like sacrificing your time and happiness in order to make them happy and it's like unhealthy for you to do that 
Right, right. And then the thing is, if you set boundaries in the beginning, you don't resent them as much at, at, at the end. Like, you know, I've had people, you know, who I said, you know, walking in and out of where I live, and like, I don't have time to talk right now. And they want to talk to me like five, six times a day, every single time. I'm like, oh, is anyone out there? Can I run outside and take my dogs out? But I've had to email them and say, I'm very busy right now. When I have time to talk to you, I will. In the meantime, I'm just going to wave. Don't take it personally. Because I don't want to be talked to five or six times a day. I talk and listen for work. To me, when I'm working so hard inside my house and I'm just taking my dogs out to go to the bathroom, that's not their time to have conversations. That's my time to run inside and run out. So boundaries. All right, believe people. You know, Do you guys think that our patients and people we interact with are always honest? Yeah? What do you do when you um, are talking to a patient and you don't believe them? Call them a liar. What would be a way to handle that? But you know they're lying, like, you know, you know, this and this and this is not adding up. I do timelines all the time with patients. What would you do? Kind of make them repeat it and then backtrack on what they previously stated. Yeah, go with, like a timeline conversation. Yeah. You know, or sometimes look beyond the the bigger issue and say, you know, I noticed that you told me this, but it's kind of inconsistent with what you told me here. You know, are, are you know, is, is there a shame issue? Or is this an embarrassment issue? You know, what's going on here? Like, is it because you want more drugs? You know, do you need more drugs? Like, you know, is the pain, you know, too bad? Do I need to increase the antidepressants, but you don't feel comfortable to say that to me? You know, like, what's really going on? You know, so I worked for Sarah as a volunteer in Virginia. Sarah's a sexual assault resource agency. And so the motto there is we believe you. We believe what you have to say. And so people would come up and, you know, I'd be sitting outside, my dog was the mascot, and they would be these booths, and people would just come up and tell me their story about sexual assault, right? And, you know, I would hear them out, you know, and just make them feel heard. And it's sometimes it's like people feel like they need to create chaos to be heard. And sometimes if you hear them out, even if they're not telling you the truth, it's like, I believe there's something going on, but this not, might not be it. You know, and it's like how you tactfully say that, you know, and it, and it goes from situation to situation. Uh, you know, and they talk to them about the consequences. You know, if you keep lying to people, these are the consequences. You're going to create a very lonely existence. This loneliness that you have already that you feel like you need to create drama and lie about to get people to believe you, it's going to get worse. You know, and you're going to have less friends and be more isolated. And what I just was doing was reality feedback, right? This is a reality of the situation. You know, like when you're listening with your friend and they're like, oh, you know, I'm dating this person. You know, they never call and they call me Friday night at midnight and you know, that's the only time I ever hear from them. You know, it's like, okay, well, let's look at the obvious here. You know, they're not giving you time. They're not listening to you. They're not present. They probably don't value you, right? That's reality feedback. You know, and you have to be, you have to think about who you're talking to. There are definitely people who I know, who I work with, they're not healthy enough to handle that. You know, they live a delusional lie. And it's like talking to somebody my same size. She's like, oh, I'm a size double zero. And I'm like, we're the exact same size. You know, it's like, it's okay to be 135 pounds. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, like, we're the same height. That's a good, healthy weight. No, 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 I weigh 109 pounds. And I'm like, you're crazy, <laughs> you know? You know, I can talk to her about anything else. You know, it's how you cook or clean. But, you know, it's, she's not going to hear it. So reality feedback, you know, for people who hear it. Validate. Validate is like my favorite word, right? And in my book, Why You Try to Kill Yourself, the guy's gay, right? And he lives a very inauthentic life. And he feels like he needs to be married and he, you know, needs to be a person that he's not in order to meet everyone's expectations. And after he tries to kill himself, he sees a nurse and they, they validate them, you know, and his counselors validate them. Why is validation so important? Go ahead. You feel more supported. You feel supported? Okay. All right. Good answer. All right. Other, other ways, other answers, please. What about you? You feel like you matter, right? Okay, so um, in grad and post-grad, I intentionally chose to work in the prisons, right? And I've had to take care of serial killers and child molesters, right? How do I validate a serial killer or a child molester that are my patient? Any answers? Okay, go ahead. You say like, even though you've made all these actions and choices, you're still like a human being. Well, yeah, I don't have to validate the actions. I can validate them as a person. You know, you need to 
this is a healthy weight for you. This, you need to have your blood pressure checked. You need to take care of your health. You need to take your vitamins. You know, you need to have a proper diet. You know, like that's validating them as a human. And then too, you know, it's like, oh, hey, I've done these horrible, horrible crimes, but I have a lot of guilt. I'm like, well, that's good. It is good that you have a lot of guilt because that means that you have a conscience, you know, and it's better to have a conscience because you, maybe you can turn around. Maybe you can be a mentor to someone else who is going down your path. Maybe you can apologize to the family and it might do some good. So, I mean, there's ways to validate people, but you know, if they're a conscience, and I'm dealing with a straight up sociopath, right? And the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath, so sociopath, you think of like the Sopranos, like I can just kill you and I don't care, no conscience. Narcissistic and um, antisocial personality together, right? And you take somebody who's narcissistic, antisocial personality, and like Jeffrey Dahmer, like collecting heads and skin, that's the psychopath. So the weirdness associated with it is a psychopath, right? But you know, you can kind of still validate them, you know, and what they did, you know? you know, them as a human being, not necessarily what they did, but if they're having guilt about it. So if I'm dealing with sociopath, you have no conscience, you know, I can just sit there and like being all charming, watch out for the charming ones. I'm going to focus on your health. I'm going to focus on your weight. I'm going to focus on your sleep. I'm going to focus on, you know, a lot of fundamental things that make you a human being. I, I'm not going to talk about your behavior because you don't feel any guilt and that's not really why we're here. Right? Okay. So validating people, let them know that they're okay. You know, I already said, so, you know, heterosexual suicide rates and then, you know, people who are gay all the way up to transgender. Transgender is eight times higher than heterosexual populations. Why is that? Go ahead. There's still a lot of stigma. Stigma? Okay, why else? Maybe more fear of like coming out to tell how they're truly feeling because they've been judged for <coughs> having been themselves and that it's not the Absolutely, yeah. Loneliness, loneliness. Fear of walking down the street and being beat up just for being who they are, right? You know, I'm, I'm pretty direct. Like, I like to be around good, kind, loving, giving people um, because that's who I try to be. Um, and I don't like to be around selfish people. But, you know, I validate people and say, you know, if you have these traits, there's such a shortage of people like that in the world. And if you have these traits, you're the type of person I want to be around. You know, these are, these are very positive traits. You know, people cannot appreciate that. Let them move on. You know, let them go be friends with a selfish person or whatever. You validate their goodness. You validate their worth. And you remind them, just like when I was talking about the childhood maltreatment, just because your family rejected you, again, that doesn't mean that you're unlovable. You need to go create your own family. Okay? So sympathize. Feel their pain. Be sincere. Right? So, you know, in addition to not listening, right, when it's just kind of like a fake answer, like, yeah, oh, that's nice. Have a nice day. Right? What is that kind of doing to somebody who's in a lot of pain, right? And you tell your story to them and they're just like, oh, that's nice. You're like, um, I just told you that I wanted to kill myself. And you're like, oh, that's nice. Like, what is that? Like when you're not sincere. Go ahead. They don't feel important if you're not <coughs> sincere to them. They just feel like you're just doing something weak for me. Yeah, yeah. And at the time, you know, especially based on age, it might be like the cool thing. Like, oh my God, that's so cool. But you know, as people get older, it's like, you know, people appreciate realness more. They appreciate people who are more genuine, you know? Like, that's the type of friend that you really want to have. You know, meet individuals where they're at, right? Maybe someone is recovering from addiction, right? They've been sober for 10 days, you know? But that's as, that's as long as they've been sober in 10 years, you know? And you lay on the praise. Well, that's wonderful. You know, or like, I, nobody hates smoking as bad as I do. Like, but, you know, it's like, you know, oh, you cut down from 10 to 8 cigarettes a day. That's wonderful. You know, you're in a great direction. Where are they at? You know, and like, no, give them a, a place to grow. You know, like, you know, people who've been in counseling for a long time, you know, they've done a lot of work on themselves. You know, there are people that's like, you know, I have a desire maybe to be a better human being, but I, you know, don't know, and if we criticize them, we don't meet them where they're at, we don't encourage them, we, we don't validate their strengths. We're not doing that. We provide ego strengths. So ego strengths, right, somebody comes in, it's like they're very confident and they lay a lot of praise and a lot of encouragement and everything on you and you kind of feel weak and it's like, okay, you're, you're, you're kind of on the, you know, catching their wind and kind of, you know, feeding the energy, you know, giving them people your energy. It's kind of like positive energies, ego strengths. Emotional stability. You know, if you role model emotional stability, you know, don't call me at two in the morning. I want a stable, healthy life, you know. Down the line, it's like, oh, everyone's crazy. Like, who do I know who's normal? Who do I know who could handle this? Who do I know, like, this? I have so much pain in my life. If I was going to share this, who could handle that, you know? And it's like, you know, 
putting that out there, perspective, you know? Like, all right, well, you never got into Harvard, but you got into Yale, so you're probably not the biggest failure in the world, you know, stuff like that. Support groups are huge, you know? I literally have had people who are hardcore saint worshipers, and I don't push religion on anyone. But it's like, I'm sitting in my office like, well, are you uh, alcoholic now? Well, I can't send you to AA. Your family rejected you. You don't have any friends. You hate pretty much everybody, but you really need support. And it's like, all right, well, this church has like bonfires on Friday, and they'll literally go just to make friendships, you know? And it's so different from their core beliefs, you know? But it's like, I'm not, and I'm very clear, I'm not pushing religion. I'm pushing you to find a support group and, you know, it's like, it's very hard to just find like, oh, I open a Facebook and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's on an issue. Support groups, you know, a lot of them through the church, a lot of like, you know, the rock is huge again, I'm not doing things, but, you know, like they have this place like safe in heaven, like, you know, so I was talking to a girl and her baby had just died right after giving birth, like three or four days old. You know, she's just crying in a huge puddle of mess, you know, I was like, that's always the hardest for me because I'm a high energy person, you know, so when I have to stop and be really calm and gentle and just sit with people in their pain, that's more challenging for me because I am so high energy, but it's like, what do I have to do, you know, besides, you know, listen to her pain, hold her hand, let her cry it out, but it's like, wh what can I give her? You know, can't sit there and say, oh, it's going to get better, and you're still a nurse and you have to say, well, you got to eat, you got to hydrate, you got to get outside, you got to do your activities of daily life, but, you know, Safe in Heaven was a group I found, you know, like by Googling it, and it was about parents whose kids had just died. I don't know any other groups. I mean, so you find out what's out there. You know, the one thing that's so great about San Diego State is they made us go to so many different like support groups, like Overeaters Anonymous, AA, like as students, I don't know if they're still having to do that, but I've used that so much. You know, be patient with people, have grace for them, be authentic, right? Be real, right? Just sincere, it's kind of the same. Authenticity kind of radiates from people, you know, like that person is who they are. You know, they embrace their flaws, they embrace their weaknesses, they embrace their vulnerabilities, you know? If you guys ever um, want to watch a really good TED talk, watch The Power of Vulnerability with uh, Brene Brown. You know, it talks about, you know, when you own your insecurities rather than let them own you. You know, like I get up here in front of all you guys and say, oh, you know, I have ADHD. Or if like there's a mistake written in one of my books, it's like, okay, well, I have ADHD. You're picking on a handicapped person. You know, like I own it before, you know, it's like I'm doing the best I can, right? Does that make sense? Think out of the box. You know, so many of my patients, you know, I was just talking to Dr. Kim at the beginning of class. And, uh, you know, they were talking about this um, treatment at this place I was at that they were going to give this patient. And so they were talking about this machine and this drug. And they were talking about how for three weeks the patient got better. And I'm like, well, they had a lot of hope going on in their life during that time. Th like, everybody looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, hope, even if you're depressed, you know, like, absolute depression is hopelessness. Like, you know, people sometimes forget the fundamentals. They get so caught up in giving people like a drug or whatever, you gotta really sit there and think like, how can I instill hope in this person who feels hopeless? Remember, people are individuals and then create visions, you know? Create, you know, I've sat there and I've done like role playing or like what, imagine what your life's gonna be like in 20 years, you know? Or imagine yourself as a parent, like maybe you wanna kill yourself now and you are a parent, but what's it gonna be like when you have a grandchildren? What's your life gonna look like then? You know, create hope for those people who are, you know, single, pitiful, and unlovable, like my book title, you know, like, what would it be like if you were with somebody who's healthy? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, getting a divorce, and she's like, there's, I'm never ever going to be with a good man. Like, it's just everyone, every relationship I've ever had is horrible. And I said, well, there's no other option. You know, motivate them, you know? You can do this. You can get through this. You guys can get through nursing school here. Pass your NCLEX, 99%, right? You guys will be the 100% class because you motivate and inspire and encourage and support and you're present with each other right after this lecture. You guys got to work on the sense of humor and answering <laughs> questions and not being afraid to be vulnerable by giving the wrong answer. All right, inspire people, right? You know, live a life, you know, try to be a role model and be like, all right, I'm not going to do this because it goes against my morals. It goes against my values. I don't do that. You know, like somebody had done something very hurtful to somebody and they were justifying their actions. I'm like, no, that's not okay that you did that. That was mean spirited and hurtful. And that goes against my moral compass. It was very mean. You know, like, hope. Give people hope, right? Faith. You know, like, hey, I believe in you. You can make it. You can get through. You know, sometimes, you know, you have to believe in something bigger than yourself. Or, and then ultimately love. All right. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. Any questions you guys have? Anything about nursing? Anything about mental health nursing? Anything about San Diego State, the NCLEX? Beyond San Diego State, any questions? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, do you ever have patients where they are clinically depressed and like have you said before, like no matter what, like they're gonna wanna commit suicide? Is there ever a point where you're kinda like you can't do anything else for them? 
Um, well, I mean, you know, then of course you have to refer them. Um, but, you know, like, I definitely involve other people in their care at that point. Like, okay, I'm a mid-level provider. I got to give this to somebody who's a higher level provider. Um, but I definitely, you know, a lot of times I'll still stay in their care or, okay, I can still provide some supportive counseling or some supportive therapy. Um, but again, a lot of out, of out of the box thinking, you know, I had a cousin that committed suicide and uh, I think about it now and I, I, you know, I tell people, it's like, you know, I've written a book on suicide, I do a suicide prevention lectures. And honestly, it's what I would have done with him is I would have encouraged him to move to Japan. Like I'm from like a really tough, like Irish family. You know, my cousin was very gentle spirited and soft spoken and everything else. And it's like, I lived in Japan and he would have blossomed and bloomed and done wonderful there. I have encouraged people. It's like, if you're gonna kill yourself, you know, think about cashing in all your credit cards and go and live in another life in Mexico. Like when it's, I mean, I'm not saying that in the moment, like don't, don't get me wrong, but when I'm creating vision, like there is another life out there, like, you know, change, make a major change in your life. But I definitely involve other people, try other meds, you know, there's ECT, there's hospitalization. You know, so if someone's definitely suicidal, you know, you, you don't have a choice but to hosp hospitalize them, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, they're never ever gonna get out of that depression. I mean, that's where all the out of the box, and you know, and you think every possible avenue, like therapy, vitamin D, you know, nutritionist, occupational therapist, just go on and on and on, and, and you just do all resources. Then you know, a lot of times you look at it at personality, just like, what are you getting from being so unhappy all the time? Like, you know, what is motivating you to not get better? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. In regards to like salary negotiation. Uh huh. Yeah, this is so important. It really is. And I was talking to Dr. Kim before. First of all, you got to think about your experience where you went to school. I think you do the research ahead of time, you know? So, you know, you're going to go work out like on a med surge unit and you go in there and you have done the research, you know what, like on a Facebook nursing group, like, hey, what are you guys making? And you talk to the, the people and like you have the things like, you know, this is what my colleagues are making. This is what, you know, it's fair and equitable treatment. This is what I'll provide for you. Or if you can prove that you can provide more for them. So like right now with me creating my own business and doing subcontracting, you know, I'm proving, hey, you don't have to impanel me into insurance companies. You don't have to pay my malpractice. Therefore, I'm gonna pay you more, less money, you know, to see your patients. So it's really doing the research, it's huge, and having that ready. But I, I really presented one interview wrong because I went in there and I told them how much it cost me. Like it was like $3,500 to maintain all my credentials and I have all of these extra degrees. But where I messed up there is I needed to go in there and say, you know, this is how much money I'm going to make you. You can take it or leave it. You know, and don't be afraid to walk away. Do not be afraid to walk away. You have to do that. You know, if it, if it doesn't feel right, doesn't resonate, you're going to sit there and be resentful and bitter. Move on. You know, it's a hard enough job. All right. You know, and then also offer people things like, you know, nobody wants to work this shift, but I'll work it. You know, so th those are things too. Go ahead. Uh, I was just curious about your experience working as a prison nurse. Uh -huh. How long did you do that, and what, what uh, prisons did you work in? I was in Virginia, Virginia Department of Corrections. Um, I did it throughout grad school, so 2008 to 10. You know, it was some of the easiest work I ever did because, and I, you know, I tell my active duty this whenever I take care of them. It's like, you know, I understand, I empathize, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm one of you. And um, so it's hard not to be emotionally connected. But when, when I was in the prisons, it's like, I'm a very, very great nurse, you know, you know, making sure they're getting all their meds, checking everything, you know, great physicals or anything wrong with them, you know, all of the side effects, everything. But I didn't have the emotional connection. You know what I mean? So I was like more robotic, but definitely still a good nurse. So to me, that made it easier. It was always very mentally stimulated, and I was definitely in a place that I needed a lot of mental stimulation, like very active brain. Well, I wish all you guys the very best. And uh, you know, the things that you really worry about in nursing um, are really not the things that you need to worry about down the line. It's it, you know, like I remember like the little things uh, I was like so worried about. You know, and then so much time. You know, I have so many friends who are going to grad school. You know, and they, they stress out 90% of the time and study 10% of the time. So, and that's so true. So, you know, just kind of reverse that and, you know, go out and enjoy yourself 90% of the time. Get that 10% done right away. You know, sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to study for 10 minutes this hour and then I'm going to go play for 50. All right. Okay. Any other final questions? All right. Thank you guys for bearing with me.